Thanks for staying with us. We're being joined by Mr. Nick Agule, and we're going to be talking about the fact that EFCC has arrested Sirica, the former Minister of Aviation, over alleged 8 billion Naira Nigeria air fraud. Uh, Mr. Nick Agule is a public affairs analyst, and he's talking with us from Abuja. Good morning and welcome to the program, Mr. Agule. Uh, good morning, and uh, good morning to all our viewers globally. Mm. Okay, Nigeria air fraud. Uh, let's just begin uh, about, uh, with uh, what you understand about this case and what you think about this case. Nigeria air was floated, as it were, at the tail of the last administration. In fact, we saw an aircraft come to Nigeria, uh, written Nigeria air, which disappeared after that into thin air and all that. Now we are being faced with the fact that uh, uh, there was 8 billion naira involved, and even not only the Minister of uh, Aviation, but his brother is also involved in the issue. We would like to just take your general view of what is happening. Uh, yes, this is uh, an addition to the book of corruption in Nigeria as we see today. Uh, I, I tell people that Nigeria is really, really very strong. If Nigeria wasn't strong, the kind of uh, corruption, the kind of uh, the, the pulling out of resources out of Nigeria by so many people at the same time would have crippled this country, would have sent this country on the ground. Because what is happening to Nigeria is like a body. And this body has got so many syringes hooked into it. And different people are drawing blood out of the body at different points, in, at different parts of the body, from the head down to the toe. Different people are pulling blood out of the body. The body will just die. But Nigeria is having that kind of situation, but yet this country remains strong, is moving forward. It can only be by the grace of God. Because as we speak today, these charges that have been levied against the former aviation minister, the same thing is happening in government offices today as we, as we speak. People have arrived at work today, and their singular objective is to take money out of government coffers and put them in some companies or personal accounts, not for any use of the federation or the states or local government to provide security and welfare to the people, but just for corruption, for looting. And what we are talking about here, this eight billion we're talking about uh, on a city, uh, 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 the former aviation minister, mm. is just a tip on the iceberg. He's a tip on the iceberg. Even himself, while he was in office, if you dig further, if a forensic audit of that ministry, as well as every other ministry is carried out today, a lot more malfeasance, a lot more of this uh, looting is going to be unraveled. And so this is the situation in Nigeria when news like this break. It's never surprising that things like this has happened. This minister particularly, if, if, it was, if this was not Nigeria, if we were in any other place in the world, he would be behind bars since. Because his last goodbye to Nigeria was one of the most shameful conduct a public officer can engage in. You carry Nigeria's money because he made a promise that a Nigeria will fly before he leaves office. Mm. A few days to him leaving office, instead of him to just accept the reality and possibly apologize and say, Nigerians, it was in my good intentions to make sure a Nigeria is airborne before I leave office, but factors. A, B, and C, etc., etc., militated against my desire. And I was not able 
to deliver a Nigeria to you. Sorry about that. I hope that my successors will be able to pick up from where we are, we are living and deliver a Nigeria. That's a, a, a noble and statemently statement that he could have made to address Nigerians. But, you know, typical of him, you know, very, uh, you know, uh, egoistic, he decided that he will make a Nigeria to fly. So he carried our money. Imagine, carried our money, money that we don't even have, that we are borrowing, to fund a, a salary payment. He took this money to Ethiopia. He, he chartered an Ethiopian aircraft. He got the aircraft colors changed to a Nigeria. He flew that aircraft and landed it in Abuja and did a photo op. And after the photo op, the aircraft went back to anybody that does that with Nigeria's money, money that could have been used for healthcare, for education, for all the needs that we have in this country, expenses like that, he should have been in jail a long time. But it's in Nigeria, that is why we are just talking about uh, uh, 8 billion now, and he just coming to, to chat with the EFCC. Okay, well, but what else could they have done? Because it, it's coming at a time that, let's assume that the EFCC has done the due diligence, they have investigated and they have found out what needs to be found out before they are coming to arrest him now. So would you call that late? Yes. Uh, EFCC have uh, done their own investigations. They have got to a point that they have not invited him. But these are on different matters, not related to that A Nigeria incident. That A Nigeria incident was shambolic, was shameful. It cast uh, a doubt of, uh, uh, you know, uh, even criminality on us Nigerians. No, it's not only Nigerians that are watching this shambolic conduct. The entire world is watching it. We now live in, a, in an information age where whatever is happening in any part of the world, everybody knows about it. And it is now on record that Nigeria, because this minister was acting on behalf of Nigeria, he was in office. You know, it's on, on record that Nigeria went and hired an aircraft, rebranded it as a Nigeria, came and landed it, and then took photographs, and then the aircraft went back to its original fleet. This is very painful. You know, as a Nigerian, it's very, this kind of thing is happening in government coffers shows that we are not even ready yet for governance. You know, so on that matter alone, he should have been arrested for wasting our money. You know, but anyway, that didn't happen. So now the EFCC has got him in their net on different matters where his own brother incorporated the company. He is the sole signatory to the bank account. And this is brother. He's also a civil servant, you know, as a deputy director. And the minister now approves sums totaling 8 billion naira plus into the account of this his younger brother. And then the younger brother transfers this money to different other accounts. And the, the, the jobs for which these monies were paid, including a construction of uh, a terminal at the Katina Airport, never been delivered. What job was delivered? If there is any other uh, counter evidence that he and his brother have that they actually delivered value to Nigeria for these monies that were transferred to them, let them put it on the table. And the EFCC is going to look at it. But on the other side, I watched the EFCC chairman yesterday when he addressed a press conference. He was looking very passionate, even at the point of being angry with the way Nigeria is being looted, taking off from the case of uh, the Kogi state governor to the case of the humanitarian ministry and all of that. Let me hope that this show of force and intent by the EACC chairman is not also for photographs. That he actually means what he's saying. That he's going to go after these people. You know, and until Nigeria begins to go after these people, 
there is not going to be any enough deterrence to stop people from doing this kind of thing that has happened in the aviation ministry and it's happening across the board in all the ministry departments and agencies of government as we speak today okay but how would you rate the activities of efcc you know uh, uh, against all these things that you have mentioned, humanitarian affairs, uh, the uh, aviation minister now, and uh, so many other things, how would you rate it? We've seen EFCC chairmen come and go. Most of them uh, go in disgraceful manners. And most of the ones that, are sh that stay the shortest are the ones that talk the toughest. So we've seen what happened to the last one and all that. Everybody has some kind of skeleton and uh, somebody can exhume it and all that. But we've seen the EFCC bosses that talk tough not lasting at all. So let's just hear what you think about how they are going about whatever they are doing. For instance, the case of Yaya Bello. Uh, he was supposed to be arrested. We hear that there was no warrant even at the time that they went to arrest him until later they went and go got a warrant and all that. So I don't even understand how they are doing it, what they are doing, how they are going to succeed and, and talking top. I, I give you an instance of the police inspector general. When he came, he was talking passionately as well. He was talking tough. He was saying that he was even feeling like a lion or was it a tiger or something, and that he was going to withdraw uh, the security details from uh, VIPs and there will be no roadblocks and all that. These things are still there till today. I'm, I'm not sure they are going anywhere. So talking tough is one thing, but doing the needful is another. So what, how would you read the modus operandi so far of the EFCC? Thank you very much. So, uh, you have rightly, I mean, correctly laid out the case, uh, especially of the uh, Inspector General of Police and the ESCC chairman now talking talk. But this thing goes beyond these officers of state. It goes right back to the table of their boss, Mr. President. Mr. President cannot be removed from Nigeria. He has to be in tune. He has to be up to date. He has to be present to the challenges that Nigeria is facing at any point in time. And that is why he has a retinue of advisors. And I believe that those advisors are the ones that are going to be picking up the hot spots in Nigeria and bringing it to his table. Since he, as president, is a single individual with only 24 hours allocated to him by God every day. And he is the one who is to manage the people he has appointed into office. He is their manager. And a manager who is ready to deliver to the shareholders, which in this case is Nigerians, must be up to the task of his desk, of his office, of his duty and the commitment of the president was that with his hand on the constitution his hand on the holy quran that he was going to defend the constitution of nigeria and that he was going to deliver good governance to us and good governance as defined by the constitution is to provide us security and welfare so if his own officers that he has appointed and not living up to that commitment. It is for him to take action. And until he begins to take immediate action on officers that are not delivering his commitment to Nigerians, we will continue to see what is happening. So for me, it is beyond the EFCC, it is beyond the IG of police, it is back to Mr. President's table. Mr. President is the one to summon the IG of police to his office and say, my friend, you made a competent speech when you took over that you are going to be a tiger, there will be no roadblocks, you are going to withdraw security policemen from private individuals who are not in any official capacity and all of that. But uh, my advisors are telling me that that is not what, that's not what is happening. You know, the roadblocks are still there, and the private individuals, some of them criminals, are carrying policemen about, protecting them. So 
what is the reason for this. And uh, if the IG does not give him uh, uh, any convincing answers, he reads the riot up to him and say, go away, within one month, do as you said. And if the IG or the police is unable to deliver on that pledge, then he takes him out of office. By the time he takes him out of office and brings the next IG, the next IG will advise himself that it's either I do the bidding of my boss who is working for Nigeria or I am gone and you begin to see changes. So it is about the structure of governance. Starts from the president before it devolves down to the ministers and the security chiefs and all of that. Let, 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 let's, let's look at what happened in Israel. The, 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 the chief, the chief of intelligence of the Israeli armed forces, he has resigned. Mm. He resigned honorably. Why? Because under his nose, he could not pick up the planned attack by Hamas on Israeli territory. So Hamas planned that attack, a very audacious attack. They came into Israel. They attacked Israel. They killed over a thousand Israeli lives. And he, he felt he has fed the people. And he stepped out and went away. In Nigeria, we are seeing how these bandits and terrorists and Boko Haram and kidnappers and all sorts of elements, they just throw in. They gather 300 school children, throw out. In spite of all the intelligence architecture we have in Nigeria, from the National Security Advisor to the, to the, to the DSS, to the National Intelligence Agency, Defense Intelligence uh, Agency, the Army has its own intelligence, Air Force has its own intelligence, Navy has its own intelligence, uh, the police have their own intelligence, all sorts of intelligence agencies who not pick up the fact that these bandits plan to come and carry 300 school children. So that is bad enough that they couldn't even pick up that. But what is worse is that after the attack happened, after the attack happened, the response, you know, how is it possible that 300 school children can be carried away even if you are putting 30 of them in a bus, that is 10 buses, and you carry them away, when we have police on the road, we have uh, uh, civil defense on the road, army on the road, air force or navy on the road, and, and the security chief just come to work and go back home, and they don't feel that it was their responsibility to prevent the attack. And even as the attack was not prevented, they could not even go after those who took these children and stop them from taking these children into captivity. And that these children plus all other kidnapped victims in Nigeria have not even been taken outside Nigeria's territory. They are within forests within Nigeria. And the entire security architecture in Nigeria is unable to use either kinetic or non-kinetic approach to get these people out. You understand? Because you cannot allow people to kidnap your citizens. And there is no show of force by the security agency. It then means anybody is now free to go and do kidnap because kidnapping is no longer dangerous. Because elsewhere, if you kidnap people, you are going to see the full force of the law against you. You know, so for me, Mr. President is the one who should actually be governing Nigeria. And governing Nigeria means he has to be, he has to be in tune, in line with what is happening in Nigeria, and he should be inviting those he has appointed to help him deliver the mandate we gave him to interrogate them about their duties. And if he finds them wanting, let's not just be waiting on this Ebala Usman uh, report about ministerial, uh, about ministerial uh, evaluation and ranking and all that. Mr. President can take immediate action like he did in the humanitarian ministry. Uh, well, I don't know. That's, that's assuming that his aides, the supposed aides that are supposed to be um, advising him are telling him the truth. Uh, that is just an assumption that you're having right now. And I don't know if the president has gone back to reading things on the social media or any other um, uh, media. 
because he said during the campaign that he has stopped reading things on the social media because people talk very bad things about him. I hope that he has gone there because no matter how many advisors you have, if you are not on top of your game, you may be missing the point all the time. So I, I don't know. Mr. President may not have the people who are telling him the truth. That is one thing you should know. And uh, he may not on his own uh, be giving attention to particular things, but he might be giving attention to others. In the finance sector, I'm sure he's very open doing and trying his best and all that. But the fact that it is just a few ministries like you have mentioned that are, being, uh, that are seeing the heat right now just tells you that uh, there is something wrong. Because, like you rightly mentioned, in every other ministry, there must be some things that need to be looked into. But the EFCC is not doing that. They, they seem to be having a, a terminal list, as one of the movie's title is, a terminal list of people that they need to go after. So that's why I was asking you to describe their modus operandi and how, how comfortable or otherwise you are with what they are doing right now. Yeah, so uh, uh, first and foremost, uh, before I talk about the modus operandi uh, of the EFCC, let me touch on the point that you raised, that uh, the advisors of uh, Mr. President may not be telling him the truth, which is actually very, very true. Uh, some of the advisors believe that uh, they don't need to massage the egos of their bosses. Uh, they believe that their jobs will be at stake if they ever speak the truth or speak their minds, which is all about the body language of the man in charge. Mm. If Mr. President is showing zero tolerance for those bringing negative news to him, uh, he's having the mindset that those bringing negative news to him are maybe against his government, they are not seeing his efforts, they are criticizing his government, then uh, he's not going to have advisors that are going to tell him the truth. But if Mr. President is very open and willing to accept the reality reports, the situation reports on the ground, in all parts of Nigeria, in all sectors of the economy and uh, of this country, then he's going to get exactly that. People are going to tell him what it is. But that aside, Mr. President cannot just solely on his own rely on uh, advisors alone. He has 24 hours a day. As the leader of Nigeria, he should at least invest one hour of his day to go through the newspapers just sharply, listen to some news bulletin, and try to feed the thermometer of the people that he is leading. Because that is where he will get it. And uh, if, he, if he doesn't want to go to social media, which I know is very toxic anyway, uh, if he's reading a newspaper, people are not going to be abusing him with the newspapers. Instead, the newspapers are going to be carrying the situation report in all parts of Nigeria. If he listens to Plus TV news or NTA news or channel or whatever news channel he listens to for a bulletin news of like half an hour, he's going to see the exact situation of what is happening in the country. Nobody is going to be there uh, speaking uh, ill about him. As we, as we are here now, we're not speaking ill about him. We wish him well because we know that as the captain of the ship that we are all on board, mm. his, his health and his well-being and his state of mind matters to all of us you know so if mr president is not doing that then let him start doing that let him start uh, listening to people and not only that mr president is also supported at home he has a wife who is very experienced in the political circles a three-time senator a two-time uh, first lady she also has her own ears to the ground you know and uh, she should be giving Mr. President the real situation on the ground. You know, so I don't think Mr. President lacks the, uh, Mr. President lacks the, the briefings. The, the security agencies also uh, brief him, you know, and he comes out to speak on some of the issues. Now, for instance, he has been speaking about some of the kidnappings. And his, his mind should tell him that if I'm spending so much on defense, because defense is carrying the biggest chunk of the budget year in, year out. And the defense apparatchik, the defense architecture, is not defending Nigeria. It's allowing Nigeria to be kidnapped cheaply and kept on Nigerian soil. And yet, nothing is being done about it. it, it that is enough for him, as a technocrat and system politician, 
to understand that there's something wrong there. He doesn't need anybody to tell him that there is something wrong with that kind of situation. And when he invites the defense chiefs to his office, he reads the riot act to them and says, gentlemen, this thing cannot happen. We cannot allow this thing to happen. By intelligence sources, we should have prevented it. But now that it has happened, which is the case elsewhere too, but sometimes it does happen. America, uh, it happened. The 911 happened. They didn't pick it up. So sometimes it happened, but immediately it happened. You saw what happened. The response is swift. The response is deadly. The response is 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 the type that the people who perpetrated it and even others who are watching who advise themselves that we can never try this thing again in Nigeria because the outcome is going to be deadly. If that is not happening, and Mr. President is somebody who lived in the United States, who who has traveled around the world, who knows how security responds to incidents like that, and is not seeing that same response in Nigeria, he doesn't need any advisor to tell him that, Mr. President, something is not wrong here, and you have to deal with it. Okay. And I'm coming to the EFCC. Yeah. Well, so for me, like I said, their modus operandi right now, they look determined, they look re resolute, they don't care who is involved. So if you are, if you like, you are an ex-governor, uh, it doesn't matter to them. You are a city minister, it doesn't matter to them. You are an ex-minister, it doesn't matter to them. They what are if you are a sitting Senate president? I'm just saying. Uh, sorry? What if you are a sitting Senate president? You know, no, just saying. Exactly. So, so, so for, for me... The, the, it is the outcome of all these things that will determine whether the modus operandi or the EFCC is effective or not. Mm. We, because we have had these kind of situations in the past where EFCC arrest people, parade them before the cameras. And, you know, like the city senate president, like you are saying, he was in EFCC coffers. You know, he, he's there as a senate president. There are senators there. They was uh, uh carlos and all of that they were uh, guests of the efcc before they are now in, sitting in the senate chamber you know you have uh, cases of uh, uh, uh you know uh, who is this person i'm, I'm trying to, to pick up but there are many the the the, the apc national chairman the embattled apc national chairman he was guest of the efcc and all of that now he's national chairman of the ruling party you know, so we have had these cases like that before, and the outcomes did not actually show that we are ready to fight corruption in Nigeria. And for me, I can only appraise this EFCC if they begin to lock up these people, bring them to justice, lock them up, and truly keep them under the cooler, recover the monies. You know, because those monies are in the banking system. Uh, a, a ministry, department or agency, like in this case we are discussing of the former aviation minister, put the money in the brother's uh, company's account. From there, the money leaves and goes to other companies' account. We know who, where this money is going. They can trace this money. They can chase this money. They have all the powers. And they get this money back into the coffers of Nigeria and use it for the purpose for which it was budgeted. For me, until they do that, I would just say it is only more of the same. Yeah, well, because I, I don't know why till now no bank or banker is in EFCC custody or in, in their radar because it's difficult, if not impossible, to perpetrate this kind of crime, money crime, without the aid of banks. And nobody's talking about the banks. Everybody's just free. Uh, transactions can be done anyhow, and nobody is even concerned about it. I'm wondering why the bank or bankers are not in the EFCC radar for now. I don't know, is there any implication or complication that is making them go scot-free? I think you have touched on a very uh, big point there. The fight against corruption, if we are actually serious about it, has to be all encompassing. Everybody involved along that chain of corruption needs to be brought into the net. And I, I, I remember that there is a law in Nigeria I don't have the specifics in my head now that talks about if a certain amount of money is deposited in the bank mm. or if it's even withdrawn by the bank that the bank is expected to file a return to the EFCC about it. I believe there's something like that. 
Mm -hmm. And we're talking eight billion. We're talking uh, all sorts of billions. You see, chairman talked about seven hundred and twenty thousand dollars left Kogi State government coffers to a school for the ex governor's son because he paid the school to the end of the 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 the, 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 ten, uh, the, 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 the time of the of his, his child who was going to be in that school. And the banks are transacting this uh, uh, transaction. Yeah. They are processing these transactions. They are not asking questions. They are not uh, probably filing those returns to the EFCC as requested. The bank executives should follow those who perpetrated this crime into EFCC net. So I agree with you. If we are not doing that, we are not serious about the anti-corruption uh, fight yet. You know, until we do that, then a bank executive who is now in a tight situation he is judging whether he should obey his customer who has got a uh, big deposit with him or he's going to go into jail mm. we make a decision do i want jail time or do i want to assist my customer and i believe that a lot of bankers would rather love their job they will love their families they wouldn't want jail time and they will start pushing back on these transactions and saying this transaction I don't understand it. Mm -hmm. Or they will file the returns to the EFCC who will follow up. So I very much agree with you that this fight must include all the actors along the whole chain of corruption and nobody should be excluded mm -hmm. if we are serious about the fight. It's all right. <clears throat> well, uh, maybe we'll get to that point where, uh, like uh, Lucky Dube said, they, they don't build schools anymore. All they build is prison, prison. Because if we follow it like that, we might have a country full of prisons and all that. But this morning, this is how much we can take it on the show. And we'd like to thank you, Mr. Agule, for coming on the program. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nyangu and uh, Nigerians. We just have to continue keeping hope alive. Mm. But it's, it's, it's very bad. Yeah. But we hope things will change for the better. We do Thank hope you. that. Amen to that. Thank you. We've been talking with Nick Agule, public affairs analyst, and uh, we were looking at the fact that the former uh, minister for aviation, Hadi Sirika, has been arrested uh, over an alleged 8 billion naira Nigeria air fraud. Okay, and this eventually is where we're going to wrap it up on the show. I uh, would like to say thank you to you for being a part of the program. Let's do it again tomorrow. My name is Nyamgul Agaji. Bye for now.